The demise of cells is not always accidental. In fact, much dying of cells is by design, a predestined stage in development. As you can imagine, this kind of programmed cell death or apoptosis is tightly controlled. Non-dividing cells are arrested in G0, the diploid state, before entering another S phase, before their DNA can be replicated again. In fact, most mature differentiated cells stop dividing altogether after differentiation. So cells don't divide indefinitely. But they also don't live forever. When they die, they can be replaced by stem cells. As an example, our red blood cells function for about 60 days before they are then removed by the spleen. They're constantly replaced by stem cells in our bone marrow. As for the old saying that death is a part of life, that's nowhere more true than in the cells of an embryo. Here's an analogy that might be useful. If you've ever seen workers pouring a cement sidewalk, you may have noticed that they first lay a set of wooden forms out in the pattern of the eventual cement squares of the sidewalk. Next, cement is poured into each of the forms and allowed to set. And after the cement is hardened, the forms are removed and the sidewalk is finished, or at least almost finished. Think of the wood forms as embryonic cells that were created to guide the formation and location of subsequent cells in the embryo. Once their job is done, however, these cells must undergo a programmed cell death. In other words, apoptosis. Another, perhaps more familiar example of programmed cell death is metamorphosis, in which tadpole or caterpillar cells die to be replaced by frog or butterfly cells. Like many other regulated cell activities, apoptosis starts with an external signal. This diagram is shorthand for a signal transduction pathway that generates a transcription factor. The transcription factor, in this instance the yellow box, activates BCL2 genes that lead to the synthesis of BCL2 proteins. For the frog, Metamorphosis results from the activation of genes initially stimulated by, of all things, thyroid hormone, which actually gets inside the cell and then into the nucleus to deliver its message. Now, let's look at how some BCL proteins work. The BCL2 family of proteins includes BAX and BAC. These two proteins interact with mitochondria to form a channel through which cytochrome C can diffuse out of the mitochondria. Recall that cytochrome C is part of the electron transport chain, oxidizing carbohydrates and fatty acids in mitochondria. After leaving the mitochondrion, the cytochrome C, the red circle here, combines with a cytoplasmic adapter protein, shown in the cartoon as a notched box. And the activated adapter proteins now associate with each other and with multiple procaspase proteins. The procaspase proteins are inactive proteolytic enzymes. These proteins are then hydrolyzed themselves, releasing active caspases. Active caspases X, Y, and Z are cysteine-dependent aspartate-directed proteases, or for short, cysteine aspartic proteases. These now catalyze the hydrolysis of cellular protein peptide linkages between cysteine and aspartic acid, which lead to death by apoptosis. Okay, cells often die because they're programmed to die. But what about the unanticipated or accidental or unprogrammed death of cells, say from injury or illness? How can we tell the difference? Well, non-apoptotic cell death is called necrosis and is characterized by the disintegration of the cell, the lysis, the spewing out of the contents as shown in the micrograph on the left. Apoptotic cells don't lyse, but instead they usually shrink and contract and their contents become more concentrated, and the cells themselves can eventually be found engulfed in phagocytic cells where their molecular components are going to be recycled for their nutrient content.